flight director Glenn Blunny said the cause of the accident remains unknown. And then he gave a cautiously optimistic picture of the chances for a safe return. I don't think anybody fully understands it, but, but it appeared that uh, something gave way, causing a problem with the fuel cell. Uh, something in the cryogenic tanking gave way, causing then a problem with the fuel cell, probably a, a physical impact of some kind. To give you some idea where we stand on the limb consumables, right now, uh, with the water that we have in the lunar module descent and ascent tanks, we can follow the profile that we have intended to follow, that is powering down the primary guidance system after the first burn, and power it up two more times for mid courses, and land uh, with still about uh, 12 or 13 hours of water of cooling available. So that is beginning to look like we are in reasonable shape there. We are also uh, studying some ways, uh, possibly get some more water into the uh, coolant system, and we're not sure how those are going to work yet. On the batteries, we again are planning uh, to follow a course which will end up uh, with about 500 or so amp hours left, which is about 22% of the current or the power available in the lunar module. So that's beginning to look like a fairly comfortable margin. The command module, which is the portion of the vehicle which will re-enter, uh, is as near as we can tell in uh, fine shape. We have electrical power, we have uh, a coolant system, we have a command module RCS system, two of them actually, uh, and all the other systems uh, are still in fine shape. Are the astronauts safe, I think? Is well, uh, they are <clears throat> safe in the sense that uh, we have the situation stabilized now, we think. Uh, I think our only concern about safety is that we're now about 70 hours for home, from home, and we have to continue to keep the situation that way uh, and bring them on home. And there are a lot of imponderables left. They have to get rid of the now useless service module and then of the lunar modules as they approach the Earth's atmosphere on Friday, and that's going to be a tricky maneuver in itself. Also, there's a nuclear generator aboard the lunar module as it heads for Earth tonight. It was to have been left on the moon to power the scientific experiment package, which was the main goal of this flight after moon landing. Mission Control assures us, though, that that generator poses no threat, that its protective shield will carry it safely through the 5,000-degree heat of re-entry into the atmosphere for what should be an uneventful ocean splashdown. So the situation with the astronauts now, as they prepare for the engine firing aimed at returning them to Earth, let's go to Nelson Benton in the CBS News Grumman Simulator at Beth Page, Long Island. The Apollo 13 crew is riding in the same configuration they would be riding in were they headed for a landing on the moon. Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes are in the lunar module. Jack Swigert is in the command module. But the engine firing they are preparing for this evening is not to put them into an approach pattern for the moon. Instead, it is to put them into a faster trajectory for home. At 9.40 p.m. Eastern Time, the commander will feed by computer power into the LEM's big descent propulsion engine. He will burn that engine for 4 minutes and 20 seconds, increasing the docked craft's speed by some 2,700 miles per hour. It is naturally different to make this burn this way. It was not planned to use these systems. But it is indeed a contingency plan. It is a plan that was simulated on the flight of Apollo 9 last year. It worked in theory then. It is hoped it will work in practice this time. Walter? One of the real mysteries that perhaps close examination of the data telemeter back to Earth will solve, but which may never be solved, is what caused the explosion that caused this dangerous situation aboard Apollo 13. Was it perhaps a meteorite? At the moment, the thinking is rather against that for one reason. Let's take a look at what happened actually aboard the spacecraft, as nearly as we know. This is the command module up here. This is where the men ride. And this is the service module, which has the environmental supply of equipment, air and oxygen, all that sort of thing, water, and supplies the power for this big engine, which is the engine that boosts the spacecraft uh, out of the lunar orbit and back home, a rather important one, of course. And that's what out, and they're having to use the lunar engine instead. Now, inside here, we can see how that, what that looks like in there. Here are the cryogenic tanks 
some liquid oxygen down around 250 degrees below zero. That liquid oxygen is vented into the fuel cells, which then, uh, through liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen uh, joining, make electricity, and a byproduct is water. One of those cryogenic tanks burst and caused an explosion. But why did it burst? Was it hit from the outside, or was there a structural failure or something else that happened inside? They're talking about impact, but on the other hand, the, t the pressure went up momentarily just before it went down, and it seemed doubtful that uh, that would have happened if it had been an impact by a meteoroid. However, that's to be studied. That's what happened. This tank in here burst, and the fuel cells were denied the liquid oxygen they need, no electrical power to supply this big engine. They've had to go on the backup power in the lunar modules. By doing that, they can't make the landing on the moon, and are depending now on the lunar module engine to get them home. Just before all that trouble started, Apollo 13 was being described as a nice, easy flight. The astronauts sent back a television broadcast to prove it. Fred Hayes demonstrated the hammock that he would have used while for sleeping while the lunar module Aquarius was on the moon. The move was so lighthearted that John Swigert then volunteered for the almost obligatory free floating demonstration in the command module, and that's Jim Lovell there, the space veteran of the group, returning to the Odyssey from the LEM, where Ian Hayes had just completed an inspection trip. It's not likely that these three men have ever, or any three men, have ever weighed such a dramatic battle so fully in the attention of the world. A foreign newspaper said the concern they create is as great as the work undertaken. It creates a human solidarity. Well, the reaction of their companions and families, first to Bruce Morton at Mission Control in Houston. The atmosphere was businesslike, but the quotes were good. This craft, I think the chances are excellent. Like director Glenn Lunny, they're safe, but we have to keep it that way. Throughout the day, the men in this room and the support rooms around it have been experimenting with ways to keep it that way. Computers and simulators have pretended a lot. What happens if you jump the service module? What happens if you come down in the Atlantic or the Pacific? And the talk to the men in space has had a housewifely, budget-conscious ring. We think you can turn off this system, we'll save an amp or two of electricity. But for now, it all seems to be going well. And Raymond and Ike Pappas report on the families. Pappas was with Jack Swigert's father. Well, I'm very happy that uh, everything has turned out as well as it has. Of course, I'm still concerned, but uh, I think this uh, hope that I have and the faith that I have that everything will be all right. Well, how is Mrs. Schweigert going up? She's, uh, I think, is probably uh, kind of cracking up a little bit be more emotional than anyone would think. She hides it very well up to a point. I'm just trying to think, what are your thoughts of your son up there now? Well, I'm just praying that he's uh, doing everything that should be done and that the Lord will help him out in some way. The Sligerts, a family of deep faith, insist that God is the fourth astronaut up there and that he will guide their son safely home. Mike Pappas, CBS News, Denver. Throughout the day, a steady stream of friends to the homes of astronauts Lovell and Hayes. Some of the tension had eased since the announcement of the accident, but the crisis remained. Wives of other astronauts brought food and flowers to members of the families who maintained their calm. At the Lovell house, young son Jeffrey went off to nursery school with a friend after watching television reports about his father. The wives say they will remain secluded until their husbands have returned safely. They have refused to talk to newsmen. Here in the astronaut compound, a spirit of togetherness prevails this day. And so it is a time for waiting for the families of the astronauts, and in that time, they seem to be holding up well. Ed Rabel, CBS News, Seabrook, Texas. The most harrowing of man's adventures in space gripped all Americans today, and that includes the President of the United States. Dan Rather reports. The president this evening drove through heavy rain to the Goddard Center, 18 miles outside Washington, for an extensive briefing on the drama in space. Talk included speculation about what happened to the spacecraft. 
Dr. John Clark and William Schneider of the Goddard facility and former astronaut Michael Collins, who accompanied the president, all answered questions. Mr. Nixon was told immediately at the White House last night when trouble first developed. He stayed up past midnight getting reports and was awakened at 3 a.m. for updated information. During today, frequent reports were relayed from Houston. The president praised the astronauts' grace under pressure and the operation of the entire NASA space team under stress. The president is going ahead with a White House dinner tonight for the visiting Prime Minister of Denmark, but a scheduled performance by pianist Ferrante and Teicher has been cancelled to allow Mr. Nixon to monitor tonight's spacecraft rocket firing. Whether the president goes ahead with his scheduled Vietnam report to the nation on Thursday depends on when, how, and if the astronauts return. Dan Rather, CBS News, Washington. Summing up, the abbreviated voyage of Apollo 13 is going all right now, with space experts saying chances of getting the crew home safely are good, providing nothing more goes wrong. The next crucial maneuver comes up later tonight, to be covered live by CBS News at 9.30 Eastern Time. Some thoughts now on Apollo 13 from Eric Severide, who is concerned that this unhappy flight will be remembered long after the tension and the excitement of the moment of ease. Eric? Life and work go on here in the capital as everywhere else, where the three imperiled young men circle the moon and the earth in life. But the quiet tension is felt everywhere, and few can address their work with full attention. The accident has come at a bad time for this government and the people in it. Too much has been happening these last two weeks or so. Too much of it adverse, painful, and acrimonious. Everyone is thinking of the three men, first of all, but there is a kind of sub-knowledge that if a tragedy occurs, it will be one of the most dramatic and dramatized of all time, and could only deepen the spiritual mi miasma that already weighs upon this national capital. So there are a few rather feeble attempts here and there to guess what may happen when this drama is ended. Whether the men make it back or not, there are bound to be weeks of investigation, and the Apollo programs as a whole are bound to be affected. Had this happened during the first moon landing attempt, efforts would probably have been redoubled. But Americans have twice walked the moon already, and the public mood has changed. Moon exploration still excites the scientists for valid scientific reasons, but not many others outside their ranks. That very difficult question may be raised on a national scale. When is enough enough? as it has long since been raised concerning both nuclear weapons and the Vietnam War. And this chilling adventure in space should at the least end the general feeling that there is a mechanical, mathematical perfectionism about these fantastic flights. It is strange that the feeling took hold in view of John Glenn's danger when a re-entry device came loose, the narrow escape of Armstrong and Scott when their vehicle went into a violent spin, and of course the fire on the pad that took three astronauts' lives three years ago. Technical failures are human failures. Computers do only what men tell them to do. But if a meteorite struck Apollo 13, that was truly chance over which men have no control. So the three astronauts head toward home across the desert of space, their oxygen and water running low. Perhaps the story will be seen one day as a parable. This Earth is also a spinning spaceship. All of us are astronauts, and our oxygen and water are also diminishing. But we have no place to go. Waller? And that's the way it is. Tuesday, April 14, 1970. Apollo 13, its power source is badly damaged. Its mission to the moon ended. Its astronauts under a strain more severe than any others have yet endured. Begins its return to Earth tonight, landing in the Pacific Ocean, 1,500 miles northeast of New Zealand, shortly after noon Friday, if all goes well. If the engine of the moon landing ship, the mission's only effective source of power of maneuvering now, performs correctly. If the engine does not perform, as it's hoped, Apollo 13 will land somewhere else, possibly in the Indian Ocean. At a news conference today in Houston, flight director Glenn Lunny answered questions about the dangers the astronauts still face. How critical is this situation right now, in your opinion? Well, uh, I think it is as critical, perhaps probably the most critical situation we've faced so far in the manned spaceflight program uh, in flight. We are about 70 hours from home, and uh, we think we have uh, uh, the situation in control. We've projected the uh, consumables, as I've described, and uh, we have a plan for carrying out the rest of the mission, but uh, uh, there is going to be no relaxation at all as far as that goes from now until splash. Uh, what 
was the most critical single thing that, that uh, had to be done last night? Was it uh, getting that reference platform set up on the limb before the collapse of the command and service module power? Well, in my opinion, the most critical thing was uh, uh, people keeping cool and getting done what had to be done. Uh, and I think we were able to do that. Uh, I think especially the pilots remained cool throughout the whole thing. And uh, the, uh, so far, we've been able to stabilize the situation, and we have every intention of keeping it that way. Apollo 13 is now in lunar gravity, traveling at about 3,500 miles an hour, less than 4,000 miles from the surface of the moon. Two astronauts are working in the lunar module, and the other is on watch in the darkened command module. They've been going through a checklist, preparing for the firing of a rocket engine, a firing designed to increase their speed on the trip home. First, they must swing around the dark side of the moon, where they may do some navigational work, looking at stars to verify their exact position. That takes place at 7.20, 7.21 to be exact, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The spacecraft will be behind the moon for 25 minutes, out of contact, and then it will emerge headed on a course for home. At about 9.40 this evening, Eastern Time, Apollo 13 will fire the rocket in the lunar module, which will increase its speed to about 3,000 miles an hour and get it home a bit sooner. Plans for a super-fast return to bring the men back on Thursday instead of on Friday, using a lengthy 10-minute burn tonight of the rocket engine. Those plans have been abandoned since they would use too much fuel and no one is sure what a sudden increase in acceleration might cause. As it is, everything is working on Apollo 13, but the ship is crippled, it is still perilously short on supplies, and while the feeling here is that the men will be brought back safely to a landing in the South Pacific, nobody is taking any chances at all. The Navy's rescue ships, including the aircraft carrier Iwo Jima, are speeding to the rendezvous in the Pacific at this moment. Apollo 13 got into trouble shortly after 10 o'clock Eastern Time last night. Something happened which cut off the power and oxygen supply in the command ship. At midnight, the astronauts were told to use the moon landing ship. At 3.42 a.m., they were ordered to make the critical firing to put the mission in an orbit that, it would, that would let it get back to Earth. That firing was a success. Had it not been, the men would have died in space. Minutes before the malfunction was discovered, the astronauts made their last television broadcast to Earth. Uh, there's a little bit of an orientation change that, uh, even though I've been through it once uh, in a water tank, uh, it's still pretty unusual. I find myself uh, now uh, standing with my head on the floor when I get down inside the limb. And I guess this, uh, an apt description for this device would be uh, a fish gill. And uh, you can see I'm weighing myself right now, and. Uh, it's a way uh, actually less than zero right now. Guess the calibration isn't too good. That'll be the day. This little tape recorder has been uh, a big benefit the astronauts cheerful and sounding worry free entered their television show and relaxed as did the men in mission control okay we've had a problem here This is Houston, say again, please. Uh -huh. uh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus undervolt. We had a main B undervolt. We had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning there. And as I recall, main B was the one that uh, had a yeah, amp spike on it uh, once before. Roger, Fred. Yeah, that 
the jolt uh, must have rocked uh, uh, the sensor on uh, C now in O2 uh, quantity 2. It's uh, was oscillating uh, down around 20 to 60 percent. Now it's full scale high again. Roger. About 10.15 Eastern Time last night, something, and no one yet knows what, caused an oxygen tank inside the service module to rupture. And the loss of oxygen from this tank immediately created two problems. Since there was no oxygen from this tank to mix with hydrogen from these tanks, two of the three fuel cells that generate electricity for the command module failed. The other problem, of course, was that the supply of breathing oxygen for the three astronauts inside the command module was cut off. There was, however, a supply of electricity and oxygen inside the lunar module, the portion intended to land on the moon. And the tunnel between the two was open, and they had breathing air, and they've been moving back and forth between the two since. Because of the loss of power, the rocket engine on the command module cannot be fired. So the descent rocket of the lunar module is being used to make the maneuvers that will bring them back to Earth. Now, since the command module is designed to come back to Earth without its service module, it does have a supply of electricity and oxygen to meet that limited need once the service module has been dropped away. That supply, however, has not and probably will not be tapped until they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Many countries offered help, and the State Department said it would ask for it if it were needed. The House and Senate passed resolutions calling on the American people to pray tonight for the astronauts. President Nixon drove through the rain from the White House to the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, to be kept up to date on the mission. Earlier, Mr. Nixon had spoken twice by telephone with Dr. Thomas Paine, head of the Space Agency in Houston. A White House spokesman said the president was concerned and hopeful that the astronauts would return safely. Tonight, a state dinner for the Danish Prime Minister will be held as scheduled, but the planned entertainment has been canceled. The families of most of the astronauts remained in seclusion, but in Denver, the father of command pilot Swigert spoke with newsmen. Knowing that they have enough oxygen uh, certainly takes a load off my mind, and uh, hoping that the electrical supply will hold out uh, another factor. Did you sit up most of the night with your wife? Yes. What was your reaction? What were your reactions earlier, Doctor, uh, when you uh, first heard there was, there was trouble aboard? Well, I, I could hardly believe that everything was going along so well, and then with a sudden uh, change, but of course that happens in my profession, too. Everything goes along very nicely, and it didn't change there in a moment's notice. Have you ever talked to your son about uh, something happening during his flying years? Well, of course, yes. He's had uh, several, well, I suppose they're narrow escapes. He's had to hit the barrier twice there where his brakes would fail. And then when he was uh, working with the North American and developing this wing to land the spacecraft on the ground, I know that he was in some very definite narrow tight spots then. little opportunity for the wives of the astronauts to be alone on this difficult day. There was a great deal of coming and going at the home of astronaut Jim Lovell near the Space Center. The family minister visited this morning and conducted communion services. Mrs. Lovell remained inside her home all day, but she did send the children to school. at the home of astronaut Fred Hayes, one of the first visitors today was Apollo 12 astronaut Alan Bean. He spent part of the morning with Mrs. Hayes and the children, assuring them Apollo 13's problems had stabilized. After the visit, Bean talked to newsmen on the Hayes front lawn. Barring any future difficulties, and we don't foresee any, that uh, they're going to be able to have a pretty uh, steady trip home. So I think that they're, they're real happy about that. I spent some time talking with the... Uh, the three children, they had some questions that uh, actually were pretty technical, and uh, kids nowadays are pretty technical-minded, and uh, tried to answer them and make them understand a little bit better where the oxygen was coming from, where they were getting the water, and 
what had happened uh, to some of the things that they've been concerned about. I think they're pretty happy now. Once again, here is the latest on the flight of Apollo 13. We are waiting now at the Manned Spacecraft Center at Houston for the Apollo 13 spacecraft to lose contact as it goes behind the moon. That happens at 721 Eastern Standard Time, and the trip around the dark side of the lunar surface is expected to take about 25 minutes. After that happens, the astronauts will get ready for another firing of their lunar module rocket engine, a burn which is designed to increase their speed for the trip home for landing in the Pacific on Friday. The main objective now is to save every possible amount of oxygen, electricity, and especially water. Supplies are adequate for the crippled spacecraft and its crew, but only adequate. Officials here at Houston seem more confident now that the astronauts will get home safely, but there are many dangerous hours ahead, and everyone here is breathing very carefully. NBC will provide special coverage of the flight immediately following the Huntley Brinkley Report at 7 o'clock Eastern Time. Good night for NBC News. The story on Apollo 13 as of now is this. All three astronauts are in good condition, although they are proceeding on a course that will take them around the moon in a partly crippled spacecraft. NASA says that while it's the most serious problem encountered in any manned space flight to date, the astronauts should be able to pass behind the moon and after another mid-course correction tonight on the front side of the moon, return safely to a splashdown in the Pacific on Friday afternoon. The astronauts are conserving precious oxygen, water, and electricity, but the scientists say that if nothing else goes wrong, there are adequate supplies of all three for a safe landing. Flight controller Glenn Lunney and other officials met with newsmen in Houston today. How critical is this situation right now, in your opinion? Well, uh, it, I think it is as critical, perhaps probably the most critical situation we've play, faced so far in the manned spaceflight program uh, in flight. We are about 70 hours from home, and uh, we think we have uh, uh, the situation in control. We've projected the uh, consumables, as I've described, and uh, we have a plan for carrying out the rest of the mission. But... Uh, uh, there is going to be no relaxation at all as far as that goes from now until splash. Uh, I really couldn't pick anything that was more critical than anything else, but I think it's the time factor now that we're just going to have to watch and be sure that we continue to operate the vehicles in such a fashion that allows us to, to live and operate effectively that long in the lunar module, or else we're going to have to go on the command module and start using those batteries, which we don't want to do. In my opinion, the most critical thing was uh, uh, people keeping cool and getting done what had to be done. Uh, and I think we were able to do that. Uh, I think especially the pilots remained cool throughout the whole thing. And uh, the, uh, so far, we've been able to stabilize the situation, and we have every intention of keeping it that way. How much more time do you have to mull over all the problems and decide or another, what you're going to do? As you would expect, and I'm sure you who have covered the flight know, we'd like to be sure that we've thought out all options as long as possible. But I would suspect that uh, within several hours of the planned burn, we will have to uh, make up our minds what kind of a burn we want to do and then concentrate on that. As a matter of fact, a number of times last night, uh, we had a number of problems, but... but uh, at some point, you have to stop considering all the options and stick to getting the one thing that uh, has the highest priority, getting that done, like securing the lunar module and getting it ready to take care of the pilots. Uh, and I think we're going to decide several hours before this upcoming uh, propulsion opportunity. Uh, and uh, then we're just going to press on fairly single-mindedly with that approach. The flight controller, Glenn Lunny, was talking about a decision that was made this afternoon, and the decision basically was whether to attempt a landing on Thursday afternoon or on Friday, and the decision has now been made to go for the Friday afternoon landing. President Nixon was kept informed all through the night and the day of late developments in the flight. The president is described as concerned, but enormously impressed by the performance of the astronauts and the scientific teams on the ground. This afternoon, Mr. Nixon left the White House for a visit with some of the scientists involved. ABC's Bill Gill has a report.
telephone reports were just not enough for the president. So late today, he drove to the Goddard Space Center near Washington for a full explanation of just what went wrong, why it happened, and what to expect from here on. White House aides tell us that the president's concern for the safety of Apollo 13 astronauts altered his schedule throughout the day. He interrupted official talks this morning with a Danish foreign minister to telephone the Houston Space Center, later canceled plans for entertainment at tonight's state dinner for Prime Minister Hilmar Bonsgaard, feeling that this is no time for levity. Tonight's state dinner will itself be interrupted while the president watches a crucial rocket firing aboard Apollo 13. The president remains concerned, we are told, but somewhat reassured by his talks with scientists this afternoon. Bill Gill, ABC News, Washington. In Houston, the wives and children of astronauts Lovell and Hayes have remained in their homes, naturally following every moment of the flight emergency. In Denver, J. Leonard Swigert, father of astronaut John Swigert, talked about the situation with Bob Nelson of station KB-TV. Well, I'm very happy that uh, everything has turned out as well as it has. Of course, I'm still concerned, but uh, I think this, uh, with the hope that I have, faith that I have that everything will be all right. Well, what is your philosophy for greeting the situation? Well, I just have to rely on my faith and my uh, hope and uh, knowledge that NASA's pretty good and they won't uh, leave any stone unturned to bring them back. And if anything's possible between the astronauts up there and the men working on the ground, they'll do everything possible. How is Mrs. Swigert? She's, uh, I think, is probably uh, kind of cracking up a little bit with this uh, continual worry. She's probably more emotional than anyone would think. She hides it very well up to a point. ABC's extended coverage of the <clears throat> Apollo 13 emergency will be brought to you whenever new facts become available. And in any event, we will be on the air tonight live at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time in time to cover the next critical burn of the lunar module descent engine.